there has been another challenge emerge with respect to the transportation of goods from Western Canada. It's the Energy East pipeline. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time on this, if you don't mind. It's very important that we know the facts about this pipeline and that we contact, frankly, friends and relatives and maybe strangers, just cold call some people in Ontario and Quebec and explain to them some of this stuff because we want them to contact their politicians and their premiers so they have all of the, uh, all of the information. We can provide some names of random people in those provinces if you're interested. <laughs> The government of Saskatchewan doesn't get for you what you should get for your oil. It never has. You deserve the world price for your oil. It's your resource, by the way. It's not the companies, it's not the governments, it's your resource and there's rents paid, but it's yours. The government today doesn't get what you should get. Because we don't even, and we don't even get the West Texas price, actually. We get some, something less than that, Bill. We get a Western Canadian select grade, and sometimes a West Texas price, and it's always less than the world price. One of the reasons, one of the big factors in all of this is because we don't get enough Western Canadian oil to tide water. We don't get it to, to, uh, to the coasts where we could get that world price. And in any given year, it could cost the Treasury, it could cost you as the owners of the resource, $300 million. It could cost our in energy sector $3 billion that they're deprived of from reinvesting or maybe paying dividends if you got shares. What the companies will do with it is obviously their business. This is a real cost to all of you. And so that's why pipelines are in our interest. We want to add more value here. We do in Regina. The upgrader happens in Lloyd. We want to see more of this happen across the prairies. But we'll always be exporting the raw product, crude and, and bitumen. And we need to do it. It's even in interest for us to have Alberta do it because, again, it shrinks the differential and generates more income for us to lower taxes or pay down debt or invest in health care and education and infrastructure in the province. So along comes Energy East. To me, the least controversial of all the pipelines. I get the controversy around Gateway. I don't understand the controversy around Keystone, but I get the politics. I don't understand what's happened with Energy East. With a couple of provinces in the Federation weighing in and saying there needs to be some sort of overlay of analysis, and I've talked to both of them, they're saying they're not putting up conditions, but it kind of looks like conditions to me for, for them to kind of be on board with Energy East. Ladies and gentlemen, Energy East is the largest pipeline proposal in the history of Canada. $12 billion, the largest one in 50 years, I should say. $12 billion in investment. It'll carry 1.1 million barrels of crude oil and other products, some diluted bitumen, but crude, conventional oil from Alberta and your Saskatchewan. It'll take it to refineries in eastern Canada where we can add value to it in our country. It'll carry light, sweet crude from the Bakken Formation, a portion of it. It'll result in a major investment in Musiman, which will be an on-ramp for our oil to get into the pipeline. TransCanada is participating in the National Energy Board process to approve the pipeline. And this is, by the way, the nationally prescribed and mandated process for pipelines to be approved. And so it should be. That a federal government would say, here's the process that you need to, uh, to, to work through. Here are the measures. You need to hit these. We need to know about environmental safety. We need to know about safety in general. We have to ask all the questions in, on behalf of First Nations communities affected and other communities affected along the way. And they're going through that process. TransCanada, as a result, has already consulted with 500 communities. They've held 80 open houses. Discussions have been already held with 155 First Nations and Métis communities. They've met with 5,500 landowners. The process is underway. Whether they're approved or not is, I guess, still subject to debate. But the national process is weighing in on it. And yet today, now, we have my colleague, Premier Prentice, in Quebec and Ontario, trying to advocate, trying to get provinces who technically don't have standing on the issue to be on side to support this. What else can I tell you about Energy East? It's mostly a conversion. It's two-thirds a conversion of an existing pipeline. It's one-third a new pipeline. I've shared with Premier Wynne the fact that for most of Ontario, and I think it's for the entire portion of Ontario's part of the pipeline, it's already there. There's a pipeline today under the feet of Ontarians that's carrying a hydrocarbon, natural gas. If this is approved, the pipeline underneath their feet will carry a hydrocarbon, oil. That oil will then not be on the rail. And that should be of interest to all of us in Canada as we watched what happened at Lac-Megantique. 
Rail can move oil, but a safer way. The imperfect way, but the safest way is a pipeline. Here's something else about the oil in that pipeline, ladies and gentlemen, that should be a great source of pride to you and to all Canadians. It will replace the need for Canada to import foreign oil. Many people in this province, I think, are surprised to learn that we as a country, the nation with the third greatest oil reserves on the earth, actually are net importers of oil because we're not very good at getting Western Canadian oil to Eastern Canada. And so where do we import this oil from today in Canada for refining? Iraq, Algeria, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, a very heavy grade oil, Norway. Why wouldn't we want to become energy self-sufficient, ladies and gentlemen? As a country, as a people, why wouldn't we be proud of the fact that we are the most responsible producers of oil of all of those countries I mentioned, certainly? Why wouldn't we be proud of that fact and say we ought not to import any foreign oil? Let's be energy independent. Let's replace that foreign oil with Western Canadian oil. And let's have the NEB go through its rigorous process and ask all the questions. But let's not put unnecessary barriers or processes in the way of what should be a national vision for energy security in our country. I've heard arguments on social media, people say, well, we don't want, if the oil comes from the West and some of it's refined for consumption in Atlantic Canada and some of it's shipped, we don't want those oil tankers off the coast of Atlantic Canada. Well, and how is the oil from Iraq getting here? From the, is it the oil ferry? Is it the... We have to deal in the facts, in these issues, ladies and gentlemen. We have to share with our friends what is at stake here. I'll tell you, I, I've had discussions with, with interests in Ontario and Quebec about the GHG piece. They want to add some analysis, uh, some GHG analysis with respect to, the, to our oil before they might weigh in and say this pipeline's good for Canada, our, the Energy East pipeline. And I've asked the question, I, uh, why have I never heard a Premier from Ontario or Quebec or the leader of an environmental NGO in either of those provinces ask what is the GHG footprint around heavy oil from Venezuela? What is the GHG, or human rights footprint, around oil from Saudi Arabia? Why in the world would we hold our own oil in Canada, Western Canadian oil, to a higher standard than we would imported oil from foreign countries? This is the case we need to make. I am concerned about the country. We need to be able to move our products around. I don't want to say to Quebec and Ontario, look, we need a GHG footprint measure on the cars that are coming here. And by the way, you want to talk about the GHG emissions problem, it's, yeah, the oil sector causes some, but everyone in their cars is, I think, either number one or number two in terms of provision of GHG. We, we don't want to get into that in this country. I don't want to be able to ask, well, how much, what's the GHG footprint around your steel that's being transported all the way here and, and used in the construction of major infrastructure projects in the province? It's not how you build a country. And so we have to be free traders and we have to advocate for it, but we have to be prepared to make the case when, when facts are not being presented as I believe they should be presented and when the country risks heading in a direction that I don't think it should. Ladies and gentlemen, as a government, we'll, we'll work hard to be that voice in a constructive way. We'll be adamant, but we'll, we'll provide facts. I encourage all of us to do the same thing on this issue, on trade issues in general.